All right, so just a reminder that we are, we are, we, a reminder that we, uh, we have a quiz on Friday, and then we have a scheduled test in the week of April 19th. Um, so rest yourselves, probably on a Monday or a Wednesday. A Wednesday, actually. Wednesday evening. Uh, we're still trying to organize a venue, but just a reminder. All right, so, um, and then the other thing here is, uh, was it here or here? Right, so because of this confusion with the tutors, and I don't know if these class reps have given you an update on what the response was from the HOD. Ah, well, I mean, I don't know. Um, they will tell you, you must ask them. I thought you had a WhatsApp group or something, or maybe you call each other. Um, what? Yeah, we're not here to discuss that. You must ask them afterwards. Um, so because of the confusion that is there, there's still no tutors, but they know the reason why, hopefully. Um, I'm thinking the lab sessions that were supposed to be handled by the tutors, um, because I don't have time, ideally I would have, I would have been, would have been doing the tutorials on the labs together with me. Um, but because I don't have time, what I'm proposing we do is we use up uh, either our Monday slot next week or our Wednesday slot or both, so that we can have a lab session that will be centered around some of the things that we've discussed under computer software. Because we are wrapping up computer software today, hopefully, and then tomorrow we transition into the next topic, right? Um, and then, so, to, to help us understand, right, some of the things we've been discussing, I'm proposing that uh, I've shared the slides, right, all the slides, the PowerPoint slides, the uh, Google, um, Google slides, I've shared them with you. Some of you, those of you that check your mails regularly, you should have gotten invitations or something, right? Yeah, so what, when you find time, right, the whole idea of these, um, the whole idea of us sharing the slides with you so that you can help us identify potential errors that might exist in the slides. We noticed this last year, right? People were like, oh, but this slide said this. Uh, it was, this says that, you know. Uh, we must comment so that we make the changes, right? Uh, not only that, if, if things don't make sense, um, what you can do is include a comment there and then we'll attend to it, right? Um, so it's pretty easy, really. If you click on the invitation itself, um, all you have to do is uh, go to the slide that you think doesn't make sense or has an error or something, and then uh, a pop-up like this. Mm. Nah, it won't help. A pop-up will, will, will come up, and then you, you, you can just say comment, and then you put up a comment. So this is an example. My other account I commented, right? Um, and this is what we will see, and this is what your friends will see, which is, I think it will be helpful, right? It, forces you to kind of think about some of these things that are in the slides, right? All right, um, if you have questions about how to do this, just let me know and then you can come through on Friday between 9 and 13 and then I can talk more about this. And then this issue of uh, um, firmware, right, that we discussed, we spoke about the BIOS, right? Um, I, I thought it would be nice for us to just look at just a visual representation of the motherboard. I'm not sure which, which computer specifically this motherboard is for. Um, but what we're interested in, as far as our firmware discussion is concerned, is this part here. Um, so when you look at slide, when you find time and go and look at this slide, pay particular attention to where this yellow line is pointing to. It's showing you exactly where the BIOS chip is sitting. That's where the BIOS software actually is uh, embedded, right? Remember we said um, it's, it sits in non-volatile memory, right? So this, this chipset here is non-volatile. Uh, so if you zoom in here, this is, this is the thing here, right? I thought this would be helpful in helping us understand exactly what we're talking about. And then something else that I thought would be helpful is uh, I finally copied this 600 megabyte file here. Um, and I'll just play, I apologize. Um, so what I was doing was I, when I was setting up my machine the other day, um, is it on? That's weird. Hmm. 
I don't know if it's because it's in 4K or something. But so when you, typically when you set up your machine, right, this is, some, this is what you see and usually your, your computer will tell you which key to press if you want to get into the BIOS, right? It could be F1, F, F2, F7, whatever. In my case, I have to press enter first, right? And then once I press enter, and I think this thing is because of the resolution it uses, once I press enter, right, this is what I end up seeing, right? Um, and so what I can do is I can move across these different tabs and perform configurations that I might be interested in. This becomes really useful, for instance, when you, um, let's say you want to format your machine. The, the boot sequence that is configured by default is generally configured in such a way that um, when your computer starts up, the booting starts with your hard disk first, right? But when you're trying to format it or install a different type of operating system, typically you will use maybe a, uh, a compact disk, right, a CD, or a USB uh, drive. So what you want to do is, you would want to change the, the boot order, right? So that the first place that the BIOS is gonna load, or is going to in, uh, kind of initialize, is either the CD-ROM or the USB disk that uh, contains maybe your operating system that you want to install, right? Just highlighting some things that uh, are potentially useful with this type of firmware we're calling the BIOS, right? Uh, I've uploaded this on YouTube. Maybe the YouTube thing will be slightly better than this thing which is hanging somehow. But you know, there's a, a couple of other interesting things that are there, right? I mean, uh, you can check like system information, um, a whole bunch of things. Right? Uh, yeah, I can't remember what else might be useful here. Yeah, anyway. Uh, all right, so you can find time and then just go to the YouTube and then try and check what else you think might be useful. And also, I encourage you, this thing, the doing, th the doing part is really helpful. Not just reading, you must do some of these things, which is why I'm encouraging you to comment on the Google Slides and watch this YouTube, whatever we're calling, right? Is that fine? Is this making, is, is this, Explanation slightly better than the abstract kind of things you spoke about the other day. Do you understand? I mean, this example of firmware now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so we proceed. Uh, we want to wrap up with uh, our discussion here. We ish, covered a lot here. Should have split this into multiple slides, slides or presentations, right? Instead of what we did. Um, all right, so we, we, we actually st started our discussion of um, this thing we are calling operating system software, and we, we now know just how important it is, uh, specifically the fact that it acts as an interface between application software and the hardware, right? Because we know that application software cannot interact with the hardware directly, so it has to go through this entity we are calling operating system software, right? Um, and we actually highlighted some of the core functionalities of with operating system software, right? For our management, memory management, process management, device management, and then we had a, a discussion on this thing we are calling um, uh, specific tasks to do with these core functionalities. So things like uh, it facilitates our interaction by providing us with um, an interface that we use to interact with the computer, right? Specifically, we were referring to the graphical user interface and the command line interface, right? Um, all those two different types of interfaces are useful in different scenarios, right? Um, I gave an example of um, an individual who is perhaps employed as a system admin and interacts with remote computer systems, server computer systems, right? It will not be possible for him to use a graphical user interface to interact with those machines, right? He has to use a command line interface, right? All right, um, so program execution as well. Um, um, and then we, I think we left off uh, our discussion on file system manipulation. This is arguably something that almost all of us have, have done before, right? Creating folders and creating files, right? Uh, but perhaps we didn't know that the operating system is the one that actually facilitates all of that, right? Those um, um, directories that we normally create, right? Say for movies and whatnot, yeah? So. Another task, right, that is specific to this core functionality is this whole notion of inter-process communication, right? Remember we mentioned that um, typically when you load these application 
softwares. Uh, when the operating system loads uh, these applications that we're running, um, typically you will have processes that are associated with the different applications, right? And, and it's easy to see, actually, I assure you. Observe. Um, if I wanted to, if I wanted to, can you see here, right? If, if I wanted to, okay, if I wanted to check processes that are associated with Chrome, I'll just, uh, I'll just, you know, kind of grab or search for Chrome here. Notice what happens, ah, Chrome is just, oh, Chrome is dead. Uh, if I, if I try Ocular, this is a bad example, Chrome is a perfect example because it, there's a lot of processes that are usually running. Let me just open it up, let's see. Usually kill it because it's, um, it's a memory hog, it eats up a lot of memory, right? You will notice just now when I open it up and search for Chrome. Yep, you see this? So all these things we are seeing here, right? All these things we are seeing here when I, um, all these things we are seeing here, and maybe what I would do is I will copy this to a much clearer interface so that people see here. Ask questions if you're not clear, don't just sit there. And if you already know these things, normally millennials know these things. If you already know these things, tell me, so you're wasting our time, we know these things, right? <laughs> so, you notice what I did, right, when I... No, that's not true. What part is not clear? You will understand, we're here to learn, right? <laughs> it's just a matter of time, I, I promise, I promise this. This will, you laugh at this. It, it's like when you are being taught how to factorize, right? I'm sure the first time you are being introduced to factorization, you're like, oh, what is this? But now you look back and you're like, oh, okay. That was trivial, right? The same thing will happen. Just give, give us uh, maybe two or three months. This would be trivial stuff, I assure you. We are here to learn. Now, look at the Chrome thing, right? When I searched for Chrome here, right? When I did, this is just a command I use, like PS, I'm, che I'm checking for, when I use PS, I'm checking for, I'm, I'm getting a report of current running processes, right? You see this here, power, it's, PS does what? You just copy it here so that you see. It's always nice to seeing is believing, I guess. So it shows you the PS command, only it reports a snapshot of the current processes that are running, right? So when I, when I grabbed for Chrome, I was, I was telling the operating system to say, I want you to, to show me the processes that are associated with the Chrome application, right? These are the ones here, there's one, right? Uh, each, each process has a process ID, so one, two, three, four, right? There's about four, four, oh, five, six, right? About six processes associated with Chrome, right? So what we are saying here is that because of of this, right? Because of the fact that uh, you typically have a lot of processes that are running, that could be running, you need a way, you know, to, there, there has to be a way in which these different processes are going to be communicating with each other, right? If something goes wrong with Chrome, and the, 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 usually there's usually the, what they call is it the parent process, right? Which spawns the other processes. So if something goes wrong and that thing dies, it has to send communication to the others, say, there's no point in you being alive because you know, I've been killed or something. Or the operating system will actually send that message, right? So inter-process communication is what we're talking about here, right? Um, and then there are I.O. operations as well, right? Um, these are mostly associated with peripheral devices, right? Uh, we'll actually get a sense of how these things work when we look at uh, details of how, how the uh, I.O. subsystem interacts with the operating system, with the CPU actually, right? But bottom line is these IO operations are facilitated by the operating system, right? This is what we need to know here, right? And essentially to enable access to these peripheral devices or the IO devices, printers, the mouse, the keyboard, right? Laser pointer, right? These IO operations here, these, when I'm pressing these things, they go forward, go back, right? Um, the operating system is the one that's helping facilitate this interaction between this peripheral device and the hardware itself. Right, um, and then some other important things, uh, things to do with protection and security, right? Um, because sometimes we have very sensitive information on these computer systems, there has to be a way in which we, we can protect our data, for instance, right? Which is why we, we have what? Usernames and passwords, right? 
um, all that is facilitated by the operating system, right? Not only that, so because this, this thing we are calling the operating system acts as an interface between application software and the hardware, there are certain sensitive operations um, that it needs to protect the computer hardware from, right? Um, which is why, for instance, when you're installing software, uh, the operating system will say, type in the admin password if you're not logged in as an administrator, right? But it's, it's trying to ensure that potential damage to, to the computer system is minimized, right? If I wanted to, if I wanted to, to uh, let me show you another sensitive operation. Like if I wanted to play around with disk partition, for instance, the operating system, my operating system, and in fact all of the operating systems, I suppose, I hope I have G parted here, maybe uh, I don't see KD partition. If I try to open it, look what happens, right? The first thing it asks is, please enter your password below. Because this is a, a root operation. It cannot be performed by any normal user. It has to be performed by super user, right? Because it's a very sensitive operation. I mean, once I log in here, I can literally wipe my machine clean, right? Format it using partition manager, right? Protection, security and protection here. Is, is this making sense? Hopefully. I don't know. Right? Um, and, and then so things to do with error detection. Um, so if something goes wrong, for instance, um, <coughs> um, um, I'm trying to think of a classic example of what could potentially go wrong here. Yes, thank you very much, virus, right? Your, your computer has been infected or something. Uh, it'll probably report to you and tell you to say something went wrong. And usually this whole notion of error detection is, um, they're usually system logs, by the way. Each computer has system logs. I don't know if people have uh, checked event logs on Windows. Have you heard of event logs? So these are details of what's happening on this machine, uh, on each machine actually, are logged somewhere, right? In the case of my machine, um, seeing is good, right? Uh, I, can, I can check, um, yes. I have uh, system logs, right? So it, it tells me, in fact, that we can do this maybe in can you do this in real time? I thought this was in real time. It's supposed to be in real time. I wish I could. But anyway, this is an example of just a log. There's, you notice that this most important thing is a timestamp and what actually happened, right? Uh, just. It has a, it has a, a timestamp, right? It has a, this thing is what I'm referring to here. There's a, there's, there's a timestamp and what actually happened. So at 12.23.57, the user light on, right, was running some, some application here, right? Yeah. And specifics of what happened to the application. Yeah. All right. <coughs> All right, so, so, so here's the thing, right? Similar to application software here, there's a whole host of uh, operating system software, right? Hundreds of them actually, right? Uh, um, uh, there's operating system software specific to embedded devices. And because embedded uh, devices will typically perform specialized tasks, um, usually these hardware manufacturers will come up with their own operating systems that will best suit the device they've designed, right? Um, so some typical examples that we perhaps know uh, and, and these are biased towards things that I've used myself. Windows, right? And it's not just Windows. Windows, Microsoft has come up with different operating systems for that are designed to perform different tasks, right? So they have operating system software specific for server computers, right? Operating system software specific for mobile devices, right? I don't know if they're still uh, coming up with, there's micro, what do they call the Microsoft? Uh, Operating system, does anyone have a Windows phone? Is it Windows OS or something? <laughs> Sorry? What is it? Is it here? Can't read. I don't know if it's Windows BSA. I've forgotten the name, but it has to be. I don't know. Um, you know, uh, Apple has come up with their own operating system, and they have operating systems that are specific to um, their. Mark a line of computers and their phones. What do they call their phones? The iPhones, right? Um, 
so the Google has come up with the Android operating system, right? Uh, not only that, so the Android operating system is meant for mobile devices, but increasingly now people are putting on those wearable devices. So there's Wear OS, right, which is specific for, like if you have those smart watches, and those things that people, you know, use when they're running or something, I don't know what they are called here, right? Um, yeah, so there's Linux as well, and when you look at Linux, right, there's a whole host of different uh, OSs that are Linux based, right? I use Kubuntu, for instance, but there's, there's Debian, there's Red Hat, there's Fedora, there's Zeus, um, there's FreeBSD, there's all sorts of things, right? There are Unix-like operating systems. Um, you know, uh, so, but the, the takeaway point here is, uh, the, one of the reasons why we have these different operating systems is the same reason as why we have a whole host of application software, right? Because they're meant to perform different types of tasks, right? Um, so I thought I would include this, this link that you might find useful. There's, uh, it's a Wikipedia page with, um, it's the best I, I could do. Um, uh, we don't encourage using Wikipedia as a, uh, as a reference, but it's the best we could do and we verified the, the references that are at the far end there. But you want to look at this because it will give you a sense of just how many operating systems are out there, right? Um, and I thought I would, I would, I would really zero down on uh, this thing we are calling Unix-like operating systems. And if, if you go online, actually, you, you notice that these Unix-like operating systems, and in fact, the Linux-like operating systems come from one tree, right? And you can actually see how these operating systems have evolved over the years, right? On different branches because they, they, they perform different tasks. And you will notice that the Mac OS from Apple is actually a Unix-like operating system. The cool thing with that is you have a Mac, you can do what I was doing right there because both Mac OS and Linux, Ubuntu, Kubuntu, Zubuntu, uh, XU, Ubuntu, right? <laughs> there are a lot, seriously. I'm not making things up though. Um, yeah, I'm not. Well, I wish I could. Uh, and in fact, right, the interesting thing here is even you guys can come up with, and by you guys, I'm saying once you get to that stage, right? You come up with uh, an operating system that is specific to Zambia. Anybody, any ideas on why we would want an operating system that's specific to Zambia? Hmm? It has to have so, control over. Okay, control, I suppose. Control is good. Any other thoughts? Well, if you don't want to answer, it will come in the quiz. Just, yeah, then, no, just say something, yeah? Oh, yes. <coughs> Yes, that's a, this is, the control is good, but that's perfect, right? It's suited for the Zambian environment, right? So countries like China, because they use a language that's not English, obviously, they're forced to come up with their operating system. North Korea, if you look up, uh, North Korea at some point uh, was in the news because they came up with an operating system, their own operating system, right? Um, they wanted to have control, right? If you use something like Windows, because it, people have, there are a lot of people that are using it, it's very easy to figure out what sort of holes Windows has, right, flaws. Which is why uh, operating systems like Windows have a lot of vi viruses associated with them, right? I don't have any antivirus software on my machine, right? But if I was using Windows, I, I, I would need to have antivirus software. I use uh, Kubuntu. Oh, there's also a Ubuntu, by the way, which is quite nice. It's specific for education environment, right? So you, someone like you, would want to install a Ubuntu because it has tools that you'd find useful. Like at second year, once you start doing 2034, for instance, the research course, it will have statistical packages that you can use, right? Those are things to think about anyway. Um, so, as, as we are, so we, we've looked at all these different things, right? So application software, system software, and then look at the different classes of system software. But we wanted to uh, just point out, I don't know if you pointed out this already, but the fact that the, already we can see the fundamental differences between system software and application software, right? System software is used to interact with the hardware, right? Directly, right? There's, when it comes to system software, there's direct interaction with the hardware, right? Um, but we said operating system software needs to go through the operating system before, before it can interact with the hardware. There's no direct interaction, right? 
Uh, so things like, uh, oh, this is what we say in here. Uh, so oper obviously, operating, I mean, uh, application software is dependent on system software, and it's a specific type of system software, operating system software, right? This, this, there was a debate here. No, you say it, uh, the slide says application software depends on system software. It's, it's a particular type of system software, operating system software, right? It would be wrong for us to say application software depends on utility software, for instance, a utility software like uh, uh, um, KDE partition. Does it make sense, right? Um, so, a point to remember. And then as we are wrapping up here, right? <laughs> a reminder here that we started with our discussion of what software is, and we can already see that there are two types of computer software, right? Application software and system software. And then when it comes to system software, we're seeing there's firmware, there's operating system, soft, uh, soft, uh, operating system software, um, language translators, utility programs. And we can go down the hierarchy and actually give subcategories of these things, right? Assemblers, compilers, disassemblers, interpreters, right? Um, decompilers and all those fancy things, right? And in fact, we can go down even further and give specific examples here, right? Um, the Java compiler, the C compiler, or GCC, uh, Python interpreter, or PHP interpreter, right? Or the Perl interpreter. Just, just there on the specific examples of language translators. Right. If you, if you could go through them again, the specific examples of language translators are Which one is Python, no, Python is an interpreter, right? Um, yeah, well, Python is an interpreter. Incidentally, right, uh, our CSE 50, 57 foot one course, we are extensively using Python, right? And I, by extensive, I mean really, well, we're mostly doing data analysis, data mining, and all that, but, but we're using Python, right? And specific, like, uh, here's the other thing, right? We're using Python, but we're extensively using three types of libraries, right? Uh, there's this library called, a Python library called um, um, Pandas, there's scikit-learn, and then there's uh, matplotlib. Now I'm saying this, right? I'm saying this because, uh, which, what slide number is this? I'm saying all of these guys because there was a time when, this is 83, there was a time when we had a discussion of, um, of application software, and we said there are these things we're calling what? Software libraries. They'll come up next year once you start doing 2010, right? Computer uh, programming, introduction to computer programming. But, but hopefully this, this thing we are calling uh, software now makes sense, right? We understand what it's about. Are there any, yes? You just give an example of interpreters, an example of an assembly Oh, we are going to be using, uh, we're going to be using, uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, uh, we're going to be using, uh, QT Spim is an example. QT, well, not, no, no, no QT Spim. QT Spim is an application that we're going to be using. I'm trying to see if, um, listen, I would have to go and look this up. I can't, I don't know what specific type of assembler we use with, we're going to be, that we use with, uh, I guess we can say it's a MIPS assembler. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised that I've, I've literally forgot. I mean, it's it's a simulator, obviously, but but it obviously has like some assembly. Homework for myself and the rest of the class. Anyway, we'll bring it in the. Thank you for reminding us. We'll bring it in the test and in the quiz. Yeah. Sorry. Specific examples of assemblers. Yeah, specific examples. Then, then what is Java? Is that an interpreter? Java is a programming language. Huh? Java is a programming language. Um, or oh, Java is also coffee. It's also a, a city in Indonesia or something, right? Hi. Can you give examples of those assemblers and stuff? There was some decompilers and stuff. So what is compiler there, right? Does the decompiler do the opposite? Yes, yes. And it's actually useful because back in the day, actually, uh, I should tell this story. Back in, the, it's, it's useful for people that do reverse engineering, right? So someone gives you an executable file and you're a programmer and you think, oh, this application is really cool, but you don't have the source code. So you can use a decompiler to do the reverse, get back the source code, right? Um, I had a, a colleague, um, 
he's dead now. Uh, I guess he's with Jesus or something. But he uh, he was uh, we used to call him Guru. He used to, you know, back in the day, getting access to software was a big deal, right? Um, and, and so you needed keys, right? And and so keys weren't really as readily available as they are right now on the internet, where you can easily search for key generators and you know. It was difficult back in the day, and by, by, by back in the day, I mean like circa 2003, 2004, somewhere there. Right? So what this guy did was he figured out how to, how to use these tools, right? So he'd use uh, the compilers, right? To, to, to get back the, the keys, or to get back the code and then cheat the software into thinking that it was actually a software with a valid license, right? So yeah, so it does the opposite, yes? Yes. They, they assemblers are a low level programming language. Mm. Then what are compilers? Are compilers machine code? No. Compiler is. Uh, <laughs> it can't be. What do you. It's. Um, now we are comparing apples with oranges. A compiler is uh, a piece of software. I, I don't know if I'm. I, could you re re rephrase your question? Uh, I, okay. Seeing that interpreters. A high level programming language. No, no, no. no. They are not. An interpreter is just a piece of software. So, an interpreted language like Python is a high level programming language. There's a difference here, right? There's, there's a programming language and there's a piece of software that is used to convert that programming language in a form that a computer is going to understand, right? So, you are conflating two different things. An interpreter is just a piece of software that is used to to translate a high-level programming language into machine-readable statements. Is this making any sense? Yes. For everyone. We can bring, we should, uh, hi, are you following? You, you're sad, right, today? <laughs> no. Don't worry, it should, be, it should be in the past here. It's just like uh, calculus, hi. Sorry for taking you back. No, that's right. Uh, so both RAM and, so ROM is, RAM is volatile, um, but ROM is non-volatile. They're both classes of primary memory though. Uh, we have uh, an entire discussion on memory. Uh, you get to understand what makes ROM non-volatile and what makes RAM volatile. But what we mean by non-volatile and volatile, and I think I mentioned this last time, is just, um, when you switch off the computer, like when I switch this off, right, everything that is in RAM will be wiped out. It's gone, right? So like this, when I, when I switch off my machine, this, this ocular application, when I switch it back on, it won't be there, right? But compare with ROM, which is non-volatile, so the BIOS will always be there, right? It's always sitting in, in there. All right, so I, I thought, I thought, I mean, talking about software is incomplete if we don't talk about these important things like uh, uh, these things they're calling like different business models associated with application software and licensing and whatnot, right? So there's this, there's this notion of, uh, so there are various business models, but they all fall within two different uh, classes. And by business model here, really, I'm saying, um, I guess classes based on functionality, right? Categories, subcategories of software based on functionality. So whenever we, we read up on um, things like vertical software and horizontal software, what they essentially just trying to tell us is that for vertical software, vertical, right? This is typically software that is specific for a particular domain, right? Uh, so it can only be used for one thing and one thing Alone, right? So it could be specific to the scientific domain, for instance. Um, uh, you know, and uh, examples here would be, I'm trying not to think of very obscure. Uh, <laughs> compilers, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, seriously. They're specific to what? Software development, right? Someone like uh, our friends that have nothing to do with, that don't know anything about software, like what we're learning, well, they don't need to use compilers and, and interpreters, right? So that's vertical software, right? 
Horizontal software, on the other hand, um, is general purpose, right? So whenever we talk about horizontal software, think things like word processors, spreadsheet applications. Everybody uses those things, right? At some point in time, the vast majority of us have to type, right? Whether you're in HSS, you're in education, you're in mines, at some point you have to use a word process or something, right? Email, right? Um, I said email. A compiler, is, oh, uh, for, for compilers, I said it's an example of like vertical software. Yeah. All right, so, and something else that we need to really appreciate is this whole notion of uh, licensing, right? Remember what, what we're doing, right? If you're a software developer, or if you're a programmer, um, at the end of it, or depending on what it is you're working towards, you're creating a service, right? And whenever there's a, a service, a new service that is created, um, there's this whole notion of value, and value translates to money, right? So the question is always, what are you getting in return, right? Which is why licensing becomes important. So I thought it would be nice for us to talk about um, <coughs> this whole notion of licensing and really just drill down on uh, specific types of licenses, broad types of licenses that exist, right? So, so whenever we're talking about licensing, we're, we're just saying um, uh, people are trying to define the extent to which you can use a piece of software, right? Can you use it for free? Do you need to pay money for you to use it? Um, before you download that game, do you have to pay money before, or maybe are you going to be allowed to use it for five days and then you, you're not going to use it until you pay money, yeah? The different licensing models here, right? Um, you, this, this is a really nice graph um, that we can use to kind of look at the, the, the range of um, license, licenses, types of licenses that exist out there, right? So um, during our discussion, the things that fall, um, on the uh, left-hand side here, I mean, uh, there's virtually, I mean, no restrictions associated with using the software, right? But if you move towards the right here, you notice that there are restrictions, right? Maybe you need to pay money, you're not allowed to use it unless you have special permission, for instance, right? Um, things of that nature, right? So, <laughs> um, so when people started developing software, obviously, before the onset of, uh, I guess, things like uh, Unix and, um, People before people started ranting about GNU and all that, um, there was this notion of commercial software where like the software was completely copyrighted, and the only way you would gain access to it is by was by paying money. And commercial software is still there, by the way, by paying money and agreeing to a particular license. Right? Say you agree to the fact that once you pay for that license, you shall not share it with anybody else for free. Right? Uh, you would be um, infringing on the agreement if you did that. Right? So, I mean, we know examples of commercial software here. Uh, the infamous, I will say infamous now because it's infamous, right? Maybe it's famous for you. Microsoft Office, right? Yeah. I don't know if you, is it still free? Is it, do you still need a license, right? I don't, I, I generally don't know. I have not used Microsoft Office in a long time. I use completely free software. On my machine, there's not a single piece of software that is paid for, everything is free, right? Life is good. Like that. No, I, I promise. I mean, and you should. I'm trying. I'm. Uh, I'm not trying to be fun. I'm throwing these things in so that I, I motivate you to go and look into Kubuntu and Ubuntu, right? Maybe who knows? Uh, you wipe clean your your Windows operating system and just install Ubuntu, right? And start using Ubuntu from now going forward. It has the same types of software that you use on Windows, right? Only difference is most of them are free of charge. <laughs> No, I promise, seriously. Like instead of me using Acrobat, a, 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 a Acrobat with a, 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 a what an illegal license key that I downloaded somewhere on some funny site, a wary site, I'm using Ocular, right, yeah. to view my PDFs. But anyway, so there's also this software they call Shareware, right? Um, typically, this is um, freely available um, <coughs> for you to try out, right? Um, after after limited time or duration. Um, you're expected to pay money. When I, when I used to use Windows when I was a student myself, we used to use a lot of these. We, we had WinZip, I don't know if WinZip is still there, right? Is there? Is the trial still 30 days? Or maybe it's free now. But who, who would use WinZip when Windows now has like a native uh, application that you can use to extract zipped files, right? But anyway, you, there was no such thing back in the day like a, a native Software that is shipped with operating system. So we had to download WinZip, right? And these 
and uh, is it Winni Ra? They used to call it for extracting raw files. It was insane. All those were shareware applications, right? <laughs> so, freeware, right? So, applications that are freely available. That the only thing here is that, uh, in terms of copyright, there's a restriction. So, the, the owners of the software still have copyright access to the, to the software, right? And in in some instances, the freeware will typically not be open source, right? So you only have access to the application itself, but you don't have access to the source code. Uh, it's a cheap trick to, uh, again, advertise your expertise in this uh, interesting world where we have hundreds, you know, thousands, millions, actually, of programmers, right? Uh, so you want, how do you stand out? You tell people, say, this is what I'm able to do. You can download my software for free, use it. And if you are happy, maybe you can contract me and then I will build software for you, right? <coughs> but there's also open source software where you have access to the source code. And this is really useful um, because it allows you to, to make modifications to existing software and then you, you have derivations from that existing software that are completely different. In fact, open source uh, uh, software is closely tied to why we had this evolution of Unix-like operating systems because Unix was literally designed to be free available right, and open source. So as a result, people came up with different variations, right? Android is open source, which is why uh, companies like uh, OnePlus, for instance, have come up with their own operating system derived from Android, right? I don't use uh, Android. Uh, the actual vanilla version of Android is an operating system called Oxygen OS, right? By OnePlus. So they got Android, made modifications, uh, sp modifications that are specific to their line of hardware, the OnePlus machines, right? I'm guessing Huawei has done the same. I don't know if they use the actual native Android operating system or if it's derived or something, I don't know, right? But people can do all these interesting and exciting things because it's open source software. And, uh, take it back here. <coughs> a platform like this will have a whole host of Freely available open source software, GitHub. Do I have GitHub somewhere here? If you are, you are looking to check for software that is open source and whatnot, you can actually filter or search for software based on license type, right? Um, and most of the things there are actually open source. So if, if you think that you, you've come up with a, a, an idea to say, wait a minute, we don't have, in Zambia, we don't have, at least I haven't seen any, we don't have. Uh, a mobile application specific to Zambia that allows people to, to let's say, share, um, you know, where they can couple. Instead of everyone just getting on a vehicle, why can't we design an application where you couple, right? I'm welding out here, but, uh, but you know that there are people that have come up with similar applications. Or there are people that have come up with really nice aggregate services that aggregate news, um, news items from different sources. I've never seen something like that in Zambia. So you come up with an idea, say I want to do this. You go on a platform like GitHub, you search for projects that are specific to that, and then you tweak the source code so that it's specific to Zambia, right? And then you start putting news articles from Zambian Watchdog and Lusaka Times, and uh, uh, what's, what's the other thing? I don't know, Muevant, right? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, so we can do that because it's open source software, right? Sometimes though, right? So it might be open source, but people will not allow you to make derivations, by the way. So it might not be free. It might be open source, but it's not, you're not allowed to make certain modifications, like work forks, for instance, which is why you have free and open source software, right? It's like, uh, so as we are moving here, so maybe uh, uh, if free and open source software was somewhere here, then uh, open source software will be somewhere here or something. I don't know. Right. <laughs> and then the software that is completely in the public domain. Are you packing up here? Why? Um, oh, well, but we just let's three more minutes. All right. Uh, yeah, we're almost done. Right. So there's also software in the public domain. Right. No copyright. No nothing. We just have the license is given to the general public. Right. <laughs> Uh, and then increasingly, I wanted to make mention of the fact that, especially those of us that use mobile apps, right? You notice that people have come up with, this isn't really nothing to do with licensing per se, but 
more related to business models, the way people make money. People have come up with very nifty ways in which they make money. Right? Download this game for free, but for you to get to certain levels, it's so hard you're forced to pay money to get yeah. packs, right? Yes. Yeah, in-app purchases, they call them, right? So these are things you should think about, right? Um, and in fact, if you're one of those who's enthusiastic about making money during this journey, and you can, by the way, by the time you do 2010, and even now, actually, you can already start building really sim it's easy to program really useful services and be able to kind of make money, I guess, somehow. Uh, I have a very retarded story here, but my, my blog, my personal blog, has this calculator, right? It has 200, 200 to 300 hits every day. It's a simple thing, it's a JavaScript, and people just, they come up, they come to the, to the post, and they type in what, what they get as a gross salary, and then it tells them what the NAPSA, what they, what they need to pay for NAPSA, and what their net pay is, and what they have to pay as payee, right? How, they ask, how do I make money? Uh, advertisements, right? My blog has strips of adverts, right? So when people click there, I make money, right? all that. But anyway, I thought I would say that. Now I wanted us to to really uh, please let's go and read the GNU manifesto. Really interesting piece of reading here, um, so that we get an appreciation of uh, licensing, right? All right. Uh, I thought that was enough for uh, software. Sorry. Oh, but this will be uploaded. It's already been uploaded, actually. Where? Oh, on on Moodle. I'm surprised that in lecture number four we're asking where, right? All right, guys. Uh, I'll see you on Friday, bright and early. We have uh, a quiz. Yes. L R I E. No, no, no. We'll go to L R I E to write the quiz. If the confusion with the power sockets is still there, then we shall walk up to the fifth floor and. Have our thing there, our lecture there. All right. Uh, oh, uh, do you want us to chat about it on Friday, 9 to 13? You can come and then we can look at it. All right. If there are no questions, I will see you when you see me on Friday, day after tomorrow. Ah. No, lecture two, lecture three. It's like probably a classific classification of computer systems. Classification of computer yes. systems. Yes. Then this is what has been coming for the mail. Where is she? There's a person I know what is happening. You're unable to access her, I'm still unable to uh, access her. Where is, uh, is it Dora? She's hiding. Oh, crap. Ah, she, she will show you how to do it. She's the one. Excuse me, if you have a... Uh, sorry, what's your name again? What's your name? Yeah, your full name. Okay, it's Hazel. Hazel Boa. Yeah, because there are probably plenty of Hazels and all that. If you have problem, if you, if you want to be accessing mails on your on your phone and you have issues, Hazel Boa is our resident expert here. She knows what, how to solve the problem. Hazel, right? She came and then, so Hazel came with who? There's another person who came. Sorry? Toel and Hazel, please see them. They'll show you how to, um, how to um, configure your, your phones to access mail. Thank you, see you when you see me. Hi, are you okay today? I'm fine. Too. Ah.